Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. You can hear that we're already giggling because <laughs> we actually, we've got a brilliant topic today. Uh, Alina, are we doing like the cultural history of the vampire? We are. So we brought you the zombie podcast and now we're bringing you the vampire podcast. So what? who we've got with us today is Violet Fenn. She's an author specialising in sex and mortality. Oh, great subject. Uh, she's written many articles on the subject, but she's also written two fabulous history books. One is titled Sex and Sexuality in Victorian Britain, which we will be coming back to on another podcast because we have to. And the other, which has not long ago been published, is A History of the Vampire Culture, Love at First Bite. Love that title. Welcome, Violet. Hi, thank you for having me. This is going to be so good. Uh <laughs> Do we just start right at the beginning? Let's just dive straight in because we've got such a long list of uh, questions. Where, where do you find, where is the very first mention of the vampire in history and how does this idea begin to evolve? It's because it's a basic human thing, you know, um, bodily fluids and it, it, it boils, a lot of it boils down to sex and death and, and, and the fear of vulnerability and penetration and things like that. So it actually ties in with a lot of stories going way back into prehistory. You know, every culture has got some sort of vampiric thing. Um, one of the earliest recognisable in sort of, I'd say Western culture, the Bible isn't necessarily Western, but is... Um, Lilith, you know, Lilith's story, Adam's wife, she went off because she was, his, she was his first wife and wouldn't bow down to his supposedly, you know, patriarchal superiority. Um, so she had to be portrayed as something terrible and she ended up being, um, you know, a baby killing monster. And um, you've got, this ties in with this, um, oh, um, Zeus, Zeus and Hera and all this sort of thing. And um, Zeus's girlfriend who and Hera got jealous so she um, oh, what, what did she do she plucked she killed all Lilith's children and then plucked out her eyes so she couldn't get any sleep to get away from it and then Zeus because he was a caring boyfriend gave her the ability to take her eyes out because apparently that helped um, so you've, you've got it going back you know millennia and the, you've got more sort of vampiric stories from the, the Jewish Sefer Hasidim, I think I'm pronouncing that right, but I apologise if I'm not, um, which talks about Estrella, who was a, a woman who could suck blood through her hair. Then you've got, if you that come That sounds up, useful. Wouldn't it be? <laughs> It'd make transfusions so much easier, wouldn't it? But obviously, because this is a woman and this is male written history, she was doing it for terrible reasons, um, because that's how it's always written. Uh, so, so what you'd get as what we think of as a, a vampire story probably the most the the, the earliest you're talking some early 1700s when um there was a sort of vampire crazed fear in serbia where um a group of people died in a village i think it was 13 people died in a village the local doctor points out it was probably malnutrition but the locals because obviously there's a lot of um superstition back then decided it was vampirism um and they dug up all the corpses and that's that actually got reported in newspapers and stuff because the newspaper media was starting at the time so that's probably one of the earlier stories of vampirism as we know it I love those times in the 1700s because when you do dig up archaeologically these people you know they've been staked into the ground and things like stones have been pushed into their mouths and basically yeah. the corpses have more or less been kind of desecrated in a way don't you it, it's... yeah yeah absolutely yeah J just because you know they they wanted to make sure they couldn't rise you know so yeah pushing bricks into mouths was was a big thing back then so there have been cases in history where people have been, so I, I, I really don't want to ask this question because this is actually one of my fears of uh, being buried alive. I mean, does that contribute into the belief of vampirism? Ta tapophobia, it's called, and um, the fear of being buried alive. And it is one of the biggest, most innate human fears. So you can see why it becomes a big deal. It's not... Um, as common not as as anyone can establish anyway it's not anywhere near as common as people think there is they think it is there's always these tales of oh we found scratch marks in the coffin this that, and the other. they probably didn't there may 
have been a few cases sort of in earlier days of medicine when they couldn't tell because even to this day the interesting point is there isn't there's a real argument about what constitutes death the only absolute and the medic will tell you this as well the only absolute proof of death is decomposition so it's even because there's an argument about whether it's when the blood the heart stops or the brain stops or you know and whether life support keep, means you're still alive and this sort of thing so in in earlier times, you know, say we're talking the sort of 15, 16, 1700s or whatever, there, there may have been some people buried alive because there was actually a case in Germany, I think. I can't remember if it was Germany or Naples is coming to, to my mind. I haven't got the book in front of me. But um, there was one case where the mayor of a town was prosecuted. This is two or three hundred years ago for burying a woman alive because he signed off her death certificate too quickly. Um, and she absolutely was not dead. She was by the time they dug her up. Um, but it's a, it's a real fear. And a lot of people have had it. Hans Christian Andersen um, used to leave a note by the side of his bed saying, I only appear to be asleep. Oh, no, I only appear to be dead, is what he used to say. And I, it always makes me think, I wonder if Terry Pratchett had read that before he wrote about Granny Weatherwax and her notes. Um, and he actually asked a friend of his to promise to cut his veins after he died because he was so terrified of being buried alive. Um, but yeah, but, and, and there's a huge um, industry in, in safety coffins, you know, especially in America. There's, there's a lot of patents for safety coffins and things like that. But I, I think I read somewhere, I looked into it, and it's difficult to pin the figures down, but I think, even in previous times where they could they couldn't check as well something like two percent were maybe premature burials it's a very very low number but yeah it, it is and also don't forget that you can people can look like this they have been alive in the coffin when they haven't been because once the body is is shut away in a coffin firstly if it's airtight it won't decompose in the way you maybe expect it to and secondly if the skin shrinks it shrinks away from nails and hair hair follicles so it might look as if those have grown they haven't it's the skin pulling back away but depending on the situation and how it's been buried yeah it could look like somebody's been buried alive but they probably haven't been and you're probably safe so the 1800s what how does TB tie in with all of this and what's vampire panic? Oh, that, that was um, the New England vampire panic. And that's the Mercy Brown story, which a lot of people would know because it's a bit of a legend, that one. Um, the, the, new, the vampire panic um, kind of circles around Mercy Brown and her family. She was a teenager and um, the family became ill one at a time and started sort of fading away. And as she was almost the last one left, obviously the answer was that she must be a vampire and she was sucking the health out of all the others um they tried to save uh, and she i think her brother her younger brother was the last one left after her and when she died they, they got so convinced that she was the vampire that they ground up her bones and they dug her up and ground bits of her up and they fed it to her brother in the hope of curing him obviously that did not help him whatsoever um and he died and um the doctors also argue it's, it's the doctors were arguing that you know it she wasn't going to decompose it was frozen ground it was winter and they were she was in a vault and but the locals were no 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 she's not decomposing because she's a vampire um so yeah but it, that would have been tb uh, and because there's a lot of that in that period before there was treatment and you know and that sort of thing there are an awful lot of of wasting illnesses you know tb or consumption as some would have called it that, that they would put down because you were just quietly wasting away and going paler Hmm. so so it would have been an almost obvious correlation to, to people at that time so continue with this whole idea of of medical things i mean some of these have basic medical explanations like for example uh with with children they just died of of sids it, it wasn't anything that somebody came in and sucked their blood or killed them i mean the, yeah 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 absolutely i mean there's a huge infant mortality rate uh, uh, you know up until the last sort of 100 years and it's not brilliant even then you know so um so yeah in, in the sort of times before this sort of period where there wasn't the greatest medical knowledge as well there was awful huge infant mortality rate so so babies would just die and so they had to blame something they couldn't get their heads around the fact that you might just die um so there was an awful lot of that and you've got other diseases like you've got porphyria, which potentially George III had, which 
um, would have sent, you know, affected his mental health and this sort of thing. Porphyria can have side effects of, of it. Um, it Well, it has effects that basically could be ascribed to vampirism. So the people suffering it are sensitive to light. You know, um, they look pale. They may have a desire to, to, to potentially in that period, they may have, a, have come across as having a desire to drink blood. It would have been a, um, a lack of iron in the system, you know, as in similar to, to pregnant women having cravings or whatever. Um, and it and that could also make your your sort of skin shrink back from nails and stuff. It would make you look sort of talony and maybe vamp vampire-y. So, a lot of it is sort of basic medical reasoning, which in these periods, you know, people wouldn't have understood. But right about then, of course, vampires weren't really vampires. They were mostly they'd have been called revenants, which are literally the undead. So it, it was a different image, uh, you know. Uh, and a, a revenant at the time would have been a scary terrifying looking thing it wouldn't have been a glamorous vampire this is the thing isn't it I, we have a very definite sort of cultural western view of what a vampire is now but because this is so widespread the the myths are just there there's no limit to the amount of i mean like i know that one of the um eastern european ones is that it's caused by a wind blowing in in a certain direction off the step and that so they're localized aren't they but we get to the the vampires that we know mm. now is sort of a Victorian construct, isn't it? Um, Edgar Allan Poe, he uses vampirism, doesn't he? Um, a bit. You know, he certainly uses tapophobia, you, yeah. you, you know, and it, it things like that, a little bit. I mean, Gothic literature as a whole really started with Horace Walpole with Castle of Otranto in um, the late 1700s. The, the first vampire, as we would know it, was 1819 so we're not quite into Victoria sort of regency still um but yeah in that in the 1800s and um that was when Polidori um took an idea of Byron's um Byron had already mentioned vampirism in the Giaour which was written in um I'm trying to remember when it was but 18. 13 somewhere around then I've got a copy of it somewhere but um he'd mentioned and that was that was from sort of Middle Eastern culture that that sort of stuff and then when they had the infamous stay on the late at uh, Lake Geneva where Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein Polidori who was Byron's physician was there and he didn't write a story of his own at the time but Byron wrote a fragment which he imaginatively titled a fragment um, of a, what was really a vampire story and he didn't bother with it because he you know, threw it away very Byron threw it away and couldn't be bothered with it and um, yeah 1813 the genre I've just remembered and um, so Polidori took this and decided to run with it and he wrote the vampire it was titled the vampire but it was spelt with a y um, and that was published in 1819. It was initially published under Byron's name because the publisher was very manipulative and realised that would make more sales. Neither Byron nor Polidori were happy about that whatsoever. Um, Polidori, because obviously he wanted, he wanted it to be known it was his Byron because they'd fallen out by this point and didn't want to be associated with him. Um, and, and also the vampire in the story is kind of moulded, uh, modelled on Byron himself and it's not very flattering. But... Um, so, yeah, you, you, we're only 200 years back, you know, that, that it turned into the glamorous sort of lady killer, sexy man vampire that, you know, the, you mostly see these days. Yeah, benchmark is 1897, isn't it? Why is that? Because Dracula came out. Yeah, yeah. Dracula came out in 1897. It wasn't very, very successful to start with as either. Um, it didn't start making an awful lot of money until after Stoker died. Um, and also, he, even then, you know, we, we've got Carmilla, Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, which I think was 1872, which is a clearly um, gay female vampire, you know, um, LGBT stuff and everything that you've been getting in there. But yeah, no, no, Dracula is is the benchmark for vampires and has been ever since. You know, there would be no modern vampire culture, I don't think, without Dracula. I have a very important question. Um, if Alex decided, or just decided, she did decide, if Alex got bitten by a vampire, turned into a vampire and then had to kill her, mm -hmm. because obviously I would have to kill her, she's a vampire, and I don't want her to suck my blood or kill me. <laughs> yeah. How would I kill Alex if she's a vampire? I it, mean... It, it would depend on which trope of vampire Alex is. You let's, know. Let's, 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 let's go through it. Why not? Let's go through it. So let's say Alex is a, is a vampire before the 18th century. How would I kill her? You Sorry, Alex. 
<laughs> at that point actually you kind of would be going for the basic obvious one where you'd be chopping the head off disemboweling her probably you know putting some bricks in her teeth just to make sure um you know rearranging her bones and this sort of thing but you'd basically be going for chopping heads off and burying her in it ah oh, okay that, that 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 is a possible i'm making notes here that is <laughs> a possibility. A stoker vampire or are we going for the whole staking Stoker vampire is your classic what everybody thinks of the vampire. You know, he's your coat hanger on which all the other vampires hang. So you are going for, Stoker gives you loads. You know, you you could go for your garlic, you can go for your crucifixes, you can go for your daylight, you know, you you can go for, you could chop his head off, but nobody ever seems to do, they always do something dramatic with holding pieces of wood and, you know, and all this sort of thing. Or you, but generally Stoker vampires, you would wait until they were in their coffin, undead, and then you would stake them, yeah. Alex, are you sleeping in a coffin right now? Uh, no, I feel like I've been buried alive with COVID, like not leaving the flat and stuff, but I, I don't think I have been. Um, but this is just mad, isn't it? Since Stoker wrote his book, society's pretty obsessed, especially with the advent of films and stuff as well. Mm. Um, it all always involves sex as well. Yeah. Uh, blood and lifestyles outside the cultural norm so you already mentioned this 19th century um gay female vampire mm. but it's also a we can ta- that goes much further back i mean look at elizabeth battery so she was a bit she was freaking odd to be honest but this but was is she but was she hungry yeah but was she what we have to remember is i i've got a lot of time for liz um we have to remember that history is written by the people the victors is the general saying isn't it now at that point and i bang on about the patriarchy a lot i do and and because it's important in this stuff it's uh, most of the history and i love men can we just make this clear right now i love them they're great but a lot of history is written in a patriarchal way um Countess Bathory was really powerful. She, um, she was married to uh, she was powerful in her own right. She was married to a chap who was a huge landowner. He th- theirs was an equal enough marriage that when he went off to battle, he left her in charge of the villagers, his castle, everything. And he died in battle. Unfortunately, not of some dramatic wound. He just dropped dead of some illness in the middle of a battle, which is a bit unglamorous. But um, so she was left at this point in time. Um, as having huge power you know she had land she had endless staff she had all the villagers um, and that wasn't a good thing for the people who wanted power over the region so they had to start um d- digging up dirt on elizabeth basically um there are undoubtedly accounts of elizabeth's terrible behavior and torturing people those accounts were mostly acquired by torturing people mm. So the things that were said against her were said by her own staff and probably under duress. There is no doubt she must have been a really hard woman. She really must, because there's no way you couldn't have been at that time. And I'm sure she did some terrible things because everybody did. Is it factual that her family, because the part of the story um, is that her family ended up essentially bricking her up inside a room, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't a family. It's like a cousin or a, a distant, the one that wanted the power anyway. She was shut yeah, away. Power, she, she was shut away. And there's all these tales about her bathing in virgin's blood. Now, if you imagine, and I thought, I looked into this quite a lot for this book. If you imagine how deep a bath is, even if you're having a shallow bath, you know, there's not a lot of blood in a human being. You've got, there's a few litres. You might get a half an inch per person. So you've got to drain a lot of people you've got to do it all at once and you've got to stop it congealing before you get in it <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lot of people around the bath at one time and it would not be a pleasant bath would it if you'd be lying in cold blood clots yeah. you know it's it's basically it's bullshit you know it's it's just historical bullshit to to blacken the name of somebody who had power and you know uh, as i said that doesn't mean i think she was an absolute saint because I'm sure she couldn't have been to be in the power shed at the time but there is definitely an angle on that story that is not valid and it is it has been rewritten to suit the narrative of history okay so another aspect of well something that's actually associated with modern vampires is immortality and you actually did a running test on social media by um, asking various random people if they'd actually jump at the chance Mm. first of all how did that work out and second of all I want to know what Alex is going to answer. So if we hit the what everybody else said and then 
and what you said and what you think and then we can hit what me and Alex think right okay well firstly I change my mind on a regular basis so if you ask me each week I tell you something different generally it boils down to no not on your life because you'd just be around for what it would just be awful if you, every time you got attached to somebody you know they die it's bad enough when you break up with somebody can you imagine just having to sit with them for 50 years till they died you know every single time um you'd watch your children die your grandchildren die, everything absolutely appalling two or three people then it was literally a very few came back and said yeah absolutely why the fuck not you know I, I want to see everything. I want to travel the world. I want to be immortal. I want to be able to see all of the things, you know, and I, I can understand that. That's a really appealing prospect. Um, most people said no, with the caveat, actually, and a lot of people came back with it with a very good caveat. It depends on whether you're still going to age or not. Because if you're immortal and you're in reasonably good nick, then great you know if you or if you're immediately glamorous like twilight seems to make everybody you know you drop dead and then suddenly you look amazing um then that's a very different to say the hungers version of it where david bowie's this crepey old bloke that's just going to lie there you know undead forever in a terrible condition you know so that's a yeah. major part of it i don't think i want to end up like meryl streep and goldie horn in death because <laughs> oh my god i was thinking of exactly yeah. the same Peter and i stumbling around a mansion somewhere with bits dropping off and stuff is oh i don't know some of that's really appealing imagine just being there with your mates and you know having a few drinks and just staggering around that'd be quite cool but yeah not with a great big hole in your middle i don't think no. you know but no so yeah most people that i asked said no absolutely not they did not want to be around that long they were bored already thank you very much with it all so yeah so what would you two do yeah Go I on, think, Alex I think uh if I was gonna be um I, f- I fucking hate Twilight I'll just lay it right out there now but if I was gonna be <laughs> like one of these uh they all seem to go as soon as they um die they also as well go two stone underweight uh, for the Hollywood. Um, oh, God, yeah, yeah, death suddenly, you know. If I was going to look like a supermodel forever and I, I could do the because I don't want to be, I want to say yes, because, like, for instance, I love, like, hiking and outdoor stuff and activities. If I'm going to live forever and I'm still only going to be able to do that stuff for the next 15 years, then fuck that, no thanks. Exactly, that depends what state yeah. you're in, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. I, I, I totally agree. If uh, if this uh, vampire serum or however I turn into a vampire makes me magically lose weight and I look just absolutely stunning, I, I would do it. I would have uh, immortality. I think I could live without... Pe- I mean, if Alex became immortal, we did it together, I think that would work out better. If you have a companion that's already immortal, then, you know, you could go and do your own things and then meet up on once every hundred years and, 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 and do things. Yeah, which is actually what? Have you seen Only Lovers Left Alive? No. Uh, no. Amazing, amazing. One of my favourite vampire movies ever. It's Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston. And they basically do that. You know, they've been around since forever. They live on different continents because they don't need to be around each other all the time. You know, they're just cool. They, they do very little in the entire film. You know, they're just cool. I was um, going to say as well, like, Alina, if we live forever, I mean, give it another 100 years and we may, fa- we may find boyfriends that are willing to put up with the mad history stuff. Uh, that, is, that is also true. And then we can turn them immortal, okay, and then we can have, like, this weird foursome. I don't mean that a sexual foursome. <laughs> that's not what I mean. <laughs> But like a companionship foursome that, you know, you guys go and do your own stuff. We go do our own stuff. We meet up, we hang out, you know, and we're all companions for the next however long till someone stakes us or chops our head off. But that makes sense. So why would you? That would be good. What I can't get my head on. Let's go back to Twilight for a second because I've got to do this. Right. Why would you agree to go back to school with your boyfriend that's pretending to be a stepbrother? (laughs) Yeah. Why, Why would you do that? Why? I mean, they literally have been going to school for like 80 years in there, haven't they? Screw yeah. that. Could you not just pretend you're at college and it's a day off? Yeah. Or it's just an be... adult conversation to be surrounded by teenagers for eight yeah. years. Okay. Oh, or it's a commune and you just all live together. You know, I'm sure there's a way of living without having to redo your A-levels all the time, you know. But yeah, but yeah no, I think most... I'd only people... do it if Bertie could be immortal with me. That's my cat. 
we'll right. figure that out let's figure it out because then I can do that with my dog and then dogs are sorry and then we can have immortal companion I mean this is turning into like the best scenario I could ever think of this is getting a good a good plan this but I've got two dogs and one of them at two years old still pees if we're in the house so if I can stop that although actually he wouldn't pee if he was a vampire dog would he no, that's true. He wouldn't need to. He wouldn't need to get rid of his bodily fluids. Maybe that's the answer to my dog peeing in the house. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> let's get to the bit everyone wants to hear about. And we'll do it in a few stages. Uh, sex and vampires, they are inextricably linked all the time in modern productions. But this goes back thousands of years. Uh, 2400 BC. Yeah, the Lilitus. Um, they, they are fascinating. You, you know they are they are listing their parents as being the undead you know or their their partners as the undead um and clearly having sexual relations with them you know back then um and you've got a lot of that surprisingly long way back you've got um august calme oh no the one I, that's the one i want to talk so i do ramble an awful lot because i get excited about this sort of stuff i remember little <laughs> things that i want to talk about king james who did the king james bible if we're, going, if we're going back not quite so far back anywhere near so far back but king james the bar um it, who wrote the bible before he wrote the bible he wrote a book of demonology um and king james goes into great detail of how you would get the sperm from a demon into a woman without it going cold right eh? he's really thought this through you know netflix i suppose at that point (laughs) he he basically boils down to it's got to run really fast between and drop it It, it's whether he takes over the body of one one of the pair and and inseminates the other or whether he takes it from the one and runs it to another one and he's literally written he wrote an entire book about um how you the mechanics of how you would do this so you know even kings were thinking about sex and vampires and this is 500 years ago what about in Hungary? We have, is it Lidert, which can present itself in the guise of a lost loved one to a lonely woman? Yes, the Lid- there's quite a few of those that disguises itself as um, as somebody you would know, you know, so it's trying to sneak in under the guise of somebody else. There is also the, I can never pronounce it, the Kirksidi, it's the Miracle Chicken. The Miracle Chicken. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. The miracle chicken basically it hatches in your armpit. All right, I just took a sip of juice as you said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just panicked everywhere. <laughs> the miracle chicken hatches in your armpit, and um, um it's, it's just a chicken, and and um, it, it's yeah, it, I, I don't even how do I explain a miracle chicken to anybody? Um, but it is a demon it's it's the same thing um and it can be passed and it, sometimes it will eat its sort of mistress it's owned by women so it likes to hatch in in women's armpits there's a fetish there and um it's yeah and sometimes they will pass it down to their daughters or whatever presumably as long as it hasn't eaten them first um and I'm assuming it makes it really difficult to get boyfriends as well. Why would you want to keep it around? Why wouldn't you just shoot it? Well, I think it's one of these ones <laughs> that starts coming back to different cultures where sometimes they're not necessarily, it, it might be living off other people's blood or whatever, but it's not necessarily, that's not necessarily the reason they're keeping it. They're seeing it as a as a token of good luck, same as we'd see a black cat or whatever. You know, okay. they'd have their black chicken. But so women you- really get the short end of the stick with this, don't they? Because what about there's a Chilean forest pervert as well, isn't there? <laughs> Oh, God. there, there is stop is it the trau- is it trauco, you the say trauco, it? the trauco the trauco actually powerful and irresistible forest creature who's said to seduce any attractive young woman and leaving her un- utterly unable to resist his advances yeah. i'll be all right then yeah there's <laughs> <laughs> but i mean who who could resist a trauco this has you been, know been written by some grotty old bloke hasn't it but you know what? A lot of the time, that is what's behind it. You know, um, you've got a uh, Benedictine monk called Augustine Cam- um, Calme, and I can't remember how long back that is. The dates go out of my head as soon as I talk about 1300s, I think. Um, and he talks of a woman who was seduced by a demon, and um, she was sort of cast out from her village as only the right thing to do, and this, that, and the other. It was almost certainly a chap that had been showing interest in her. Um, and 
the story went that this chap presented himself to her and she fell for it and she clearly supposedly went and slept with this man when she shouldn't have done um and this was terrible um but therefore it must have been a demon because a man would never do such a thing you know a gentleman wouldn't do that sort of thing um but clearly i think quite a lot of the time it was the gentleman concerned you know so the trioco may well have come from stories of also women did use this well you know we can be devious at times if if, if you wanted to get it on with the hot stuff from the next village and you need a vampire made me do it yeah exactly <laughs> The vampire made me do it. That is it. That comes, that is what, and that is what ties in with a lot of vampire stories. A lot of it is to do with seduction and it's, oh, oh, I need to look like I don't want to, but I'll be overpowered and then it'll be okay, you know? And the, so it comes. I was going to say, let's start moving into the 20th century though. So right at the turn of the century, um, once again, Bram Stoker, one of the big themes of his book is desire, isn't mm -hmm. it? Just yeah fueled this but then take us forward into the 20th century uh let's do the 70s with vampire lovers uh this is all a bit nuts isn't it well do you mean um so, so in the movies the, yeah the, the so we mo start moving into film history yeah uh, yeah Charlie yeah. would love if she was here uh so we get to the 1970s and we've got vampire lovers yeah, and you start getting into um, Hammer, Hammer from the 50s onwards are starting to turn it into sort of, it's almost pseudo soft porn, you know, and, and then it gets into it sort of thing. Um, and you've got people like Ingrid Pitt and, you know, and, and people like this looking amazing. Uh, and it's really, it's just a cover for our oh, women really want to, even when they say they don't. And um and animal instincts and it's a way of getting this sort of stuff onto the screen that they perhaps wouldn't have got certified otherwise um the problem with the the movie angler and i found that really difficult in the, with this book there are just so many of them we forget how massive you know popular culture is i mean when when i titled this book a history of the vampire popular culture it was really important that it was a history not the history because it's yeah, a yeah. it's my history of it anybody anybody even if they'd watched the same movies and videos and read the same books as me would have written a different one whoever's done it would write a different one because you've all got different favorites or different hate topics and you know um but when you get into movies i mean it's never ending um you've got yeah you've got things like vampire lovers you've got um and christopher lee in the 1958 Dracula is just the archetypal hot vampire to me. Um, to, on, and I think a lot of sins have been based on that. Um, and you've got things like The Hunger, which I think Roger Ebert once described as, you know, a fairly terrible movie around a beautiful sex scene. So even somebody as illustrious as him is, is bringing it down to two women getting it on in the middle of the movie sort of thing. Whereas actually it's, it's a clever movie. It's a beautiful movie. Um, so, yeah, there, there is a tendency for everyone to assume that vampires equal sex. And that's because a lot of the time they do. It isn't necessarily in a graphic manner, but it's to do with the sexuality of vulnerability. And, and it does come down to, you know, penetration, teeth and necks. It's, it's soft and it's sensitive and it's intimate. You know, as soon as you get intimate with somebody, you, you know, they're nibbling your neck, aren't they? If, if they know what they're doing, you know. <laughs> And, and so that's a lot of it. And, and some of it was an excuse for getting, you know, people like Ingrid Pitt and the like, you know, half naked in, in, in diaphanous little frocks, you know. Um, but you could go on about the movies for hours. The last time I tried to talk to this about this on an interview, it was meant to be 20 minutes. It went on for two hours. And um, it, it's just never ending. You know, as, and as we've seen, you know, Twilight brought it all back again. And luckily there were some better ones and True Blood, which I think is one of the best ones. Um, How does it all tie in with the 80s and the goth scene? Right. Well, well, that was my scene back in the 2000s. <clears throat> what do you mean back in? I, I was, I'm old enough to have grown up with it, you know, in the 80s. <laughs> so it, it was new to me. I, I say to my kids, my kids are terrible goths. And I always say there's no such thing as a terrible goth, but the whole household is. And I always say, you know, I was there when it was just all fields, you know, like some mad elder goth. Um, I think the thing is, an awful lot of goths, and I can't speak for all goths because some of the biggest goths I know look like social workers if you sort them in the street. It's a mentality rather than a, a look or an effort or whatever. Um, 
And so most goths, I think, are interested in vampires. Not all people that love vampires are going to be goths because it doesn't work like that. But I think the gothic aesthetic, because I grew up with it coming out of, um, you know, punk in the 70s and the damned and, and that sort of thing. And you've got Bauhaus and, and Sisters of Mercy. Um, I grew up with that. So the image and the music all kind of tied in together. And they they used a lot of the vampire references. And and random fact for people that don't know is that Pete Murphy from Bauhaus is the old goth in Eclipse um, on, on the Twilight Saga series. When it does a throwback and there's an old uh, there's an old vampire coming um killing off all the, all the villagers and that that's the beginning of the werewolves so that's peter murphy from bauhaus standing there um so yeah i think they're just very intertwined because of the aesthetics you know um it's the look it's the i would i would hate to live in that sort of thing i love the look of a crumbling castle but i like my central heating that said i live in a 1960s terrace but i've got a four poster which currently has two huge victorian frocks hanging off it because I've got nowhere to put them <laughs> but you know I'd still put me um my leggings on to go and walk the dogs I I wouldn't look like a goth in the street I, I'm sure anyone that knows me is going to disagree with that because I'm covered in tattoos and all sorts but um I don't think I would look that in the street but but the yeah the aesthetics go together I think and you know you've got things like Whitby and I've got lovely friends of mine run the Tomorrow's Ghost Festival which runs at Whitby um and I wouldn't say the people behind it are particularly goth in their outlook, but they really are in their blood, you know, whether they like it or not. I think sometimes it, it doesn't always tie together. But yeah, and a, and a very lovely friend of mine, Lee, founded World Goth Day, you know, and he started that as a joke. He's a real life friend of mine. And he started that as a, a bit of a joke many, many years ago. And that has sprung into a life of its own you know uh, so there and he has a huge amount of people from south america you know apparently there are amazonian goths in their full get up in the all the heat um and they and a lot of it comes back to their own culture you know everybody everybody wherever you are has got either the miracle chicken or the lolitu or you know this sort of thing in their back history so you can tie it back to something everywhere and i think that's because it's an innate human thing we fear death we think we desire immortality and we'd all like to look really hot in a frock. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of yeah. time it boils down to that. We want an escape because well, mortality is boring. Going to make sure that the cartoon for this episode has an evil miracle chicken in it. Um, I will find you a photo of the miracle chicken for death. It's amazing. Uh, before we go, Violet, tell us what is your favourite vampire film or TV series? Oh God, I knew you were going to ask me this. Um, and, and, and it's awful because I don't want to pick just one of them. I'm going to pick two because I'm going to cheat. Absolute favourite, if I could only have one, one ever, Christopher Lee, 1958, Hammer Dracula. He's just a God. He's just a God. I mean, the man made a heavy metal album in his 90s. You know, he's just Charlemagne. It's wonderful. Listen to it if you haven't already. And Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman yeah. as, as Bram Stoker's Dracula, which isn't as accurate as the title makes it out to be, but is the nearest you're going to get. He, I think, is the archetype Dracula. Yeah, I'd go with him. Yeah, I think I'd probably go with him. He scared the living crap out of me, but I actually, I really like 30 Days of Night. Yeah, it, they, this is the thing. There's, there's things to be said for all of them. You know, like I said, I love the True Blood Wars. I loved the BBC adaptation that seemed to be a marmite people either loved it or hated it. i loved it so much i ended up on the radio times and everything talking about it because i just got so manic about it and i thought that was wonderful um because it, it changed it and gave him a modern edge which and he was the more like what a real one would actually act like so yeah I th and you know my kids would pick the more sort of proper killy horror movie vampires i think we I'm an all agree that twilight's shit Twilight is shit. I said I'm an avid reader, so for me, I've got to go down the road of Anne Rice. I've read all of her books. Yeah. Um, films, Interview of the Vampire was good, but I was so upset with Queen of the Damned. It was so awful. And oh, it just don't. didn't stick to the storyline of how it was supposed to. So much more in the book and so much. They should I'd have, have done... I 
I'd avoided it for years because I knew I wouldn't like it. And I watched it whilst writing this book because I thought I really have got to do it, you know, and I've got to watch it. And I was so disappointed in that film. I did, Me too. I thought that was really disappointing. Yeah. But read the books. The, I love Anne Rice books. I think she's absolutely fantastic. She's It's a very hard read. She's very difficult to read. Yes, but... I've got the book of the first, you know, the actual book, the interview with the vampire one. And I've read that and I love the film, you know, although, you know, in the movie version, Brad Pitt needs a kick up the ass through most of it because God, he whines. Yeah. But... <laughs> Yeah, He's such a whiner. But yeah, they're I beautiful. I really liked um, Elizabeth Costova's The Historian. That's one I haven't. I haven't read that one. No, I really like that one. Oh, I see. I'm making. I'm writing notes as I'm talking about this because this is a thing you could go on forever. You know, and, and and you know this. I've had people say I've covered too much in this book. I've had other people say, "Oh, you haven't covered enough." I couldn't ever do it right as far as everyone was concerned because I, the only way to do it was to pick the ones that I thought were good good examples and everybody will have their own versions of it absolutely exactly exactly I agree Violet this has been so enlightening I mean talking about vampires going from a podcast on zombies a couple of months ago to a podcast on vampires has just been an absolute blast and Alex and I love to have fun with a bit of pod with a podcast with uh, history and modern culture kind of intertwined in it because we get to have a really good discussion so thank you so much for joining us and ladies and gentlemen don't forget to go to our online bookstore where you can grab copies of Violet's book on vampires thank you so much for joining us thank you you can help us at History Hack by joining us via Patreon. It takes quite a lot of effort and a lot of work of quite a big team now to keep us going. And so if you could donate as little as £3 a month, it would be massively appreciated by all of us. There's different levels because Princess Marcus has set it all up with uh, varying rewards and things. So do have a look. Do join us. There's uh, an exclusive Facebook group as well and you can be part of all of it. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 